Hello and welcome to this blog on the Historic Pubs of Wales series. Today coming to you from the Plough and Harrow here in the sunny Vale of Glamorgan. In the 17th and 19th century this area was rife with piracy, with smuggling and with shipwreckers. And one particularly notorious devontee of all three arts from this village, a chap by the name of Matt of the Iron Hand, had a reputation for being particularly brutal. He used to tie lanterns to the tails of sheep grazing on the cliffs at Wick Beach to lure ships onto the rocks. Countless souls were lost as a result, uh, and he and his henchmen would comb the beaches in search of survivors. Not to save them, you understand, but to dispatch them, because at the time the law said that any scavengers could only keep what they found on the beaches if there were no survivors. So they had to take it on themselves to make sure that there were no survivors. But as interesting and grisly as uh, the, the episodes of Matt of the Iron Hand might be, that is just a tiny, tiny little part of the history of this great place. So here we are now at the back of the pub, and as we sweep around, we can see that it aligns with some rather curious structures. So, we may well be asking, what is all this? What are these buildings and these, and these remains? What we have here is the remains of a 12th century Cistercian monastic grange. This place was built in 1130 by a Norman knight called Richard de Granville, and he was a very powerful and very wealthy man. Uh, in fact, he was one of the legendary 12 knights of Glamorgan, that legend having been penned less than three miles up the road in St. Donat's Castle by Sir Edward Stradling. As much as there is a legend of the Twelve Knights, Richard de Granville was a very real person and he invested a lot of his personal fortune into building the Abbey at Neath, which transpired to be one of the finest examples of Cistercian architecture in 12th century Britain. Now this place was part of the machinery that allowed Neath Abbey to thrive, a cog in the wheel if you like, because it was the job of this place to produce the food that would sustain the monks over in Neath. And for that purpose, it was very, very well selected. This area was famous for the fertility of its soil, leading to the Vale of Glamorgan being called the Garden of Wales. So what we have here then is a really significant building with a very important role and function supported by a very wealthy benefactor. So, why is it in ruins? What happened here? What went wrong? Well, that was all at the hands of King Henry VIII. He decided that the monks and abbots of Britain held too much wealth, land and power, all of which were things he wanted more of. So he set about taking it from them in a five-year purge. It started in 1536 and became known as the Dissolution of the Monasteries. One by one, they were ordered to hand over their treasures and assets, and the buildings which they had occupied were seized and sold off, or were doled out to the king's supporters and favourites as patronage. Some of these properties were highly prized. They may have been in very desirable areas, for example, in which case they were snapped up by aristocrats and turned into large country houses. Margham Park, near Port Albert, was an example of this. As much as it's a very grand country house now, it started out as Margham Abbey. And Scare House, a very well-known 16th century manor house at the end of the dunes on the coastline between Porthcawl and Kenfig. That was originally a Cistercian monastic grange as well, also annexed to Neath Abbey. So it has exactly the same history as Monk Nash. But for whatever reason, Scare was seen as a desirable place to live. So it was snapped up and converted into a house. That was the fate of a lot of monastic buildings like this, which is why there are so many old mansions called The Grange. But for whatever reason, Monk Nash was not seen as a desirable place for an aristocrat to live. So, maybe not seen as a desirable place to live, but certainly a desirable place to farm. So, any of the monastic buildings that could be recycled to make into barns or to make into farm cottages that's what happened to them. But there were some buildings here, like of course the chapel and the cloisters, which were so specific in terms of what they were designed to do, they were very difficult to re-employ. So, uh, given that 
the roofing was all surrounded by lead, which was a very essential and a very expensive building material, all the lead got stripped off the roof of those buildings and as soon as the lead was gone, very, very quickly, the wind and the rain and the weather got in and that started to decimate the masonry, which is why there is so little left of what was here originally. I don't know about you, but whenever I visit a place like this and look around at the ruined remains that are here, I just can't help but try and think what this place would have looked like when it was in its heyday. The trouble is these remains have been so decimated by weather down the centuries, it's very difficult to get a really clear picture of how they would have once looked. Or at least it would be if it wasn't for what you might describe as a very early example of globalisation. Back in the 11th and 12th centuries, monks from the Cistercian order were pioneers of architecture and structural engineering. They developed features like ribbed vaults and pointed arches in their buildings, which became known as the Burgundian style, as Cito in Burgundy is where the order was founded. It was a forerunner to styles we might recognise as Gothic architecture. The Cistercians had their own teams of architects, stonemasons and craftspeople who were deployed all over Europe to make sure that their monastic buildings conformed to a uniform standard style and layout. It meant that if you wandered into an abbey or a monastery anywhere in Europe, whether it was Neath, Neem or Neyman, it would look pretty much exactly the same. So if we want to get an idea of what the Grange at Monknash looked like, all we need to do is find another Cistercian order monastic grange built around the same time. And that's exactly what this is. This is a Cistercian monastic grange built in Burgundy within 20 years of the one here in Monk Nash. So it is contemporary. And as much as we cannot be certain of exactly how similar these two structures were, we can be confident that they would have been broadly similar. The biggest differences would have been the building materials used. Red roof tiles, for example, are a very distinctive feature of buildings in Burgundy, even today. But given the abundance of limestone around Monk Nash, the chances are it would have had a stone roof and the general colour of the local stone was the grey colour you see in the ruins of the day. We can be altogether more confident of the floor plan, however, as that was followed in most monastic buildings of the time, regardless of size or status. If we compare this floor plan with the Burgundian Grange, inverted so everything is roughly where it should be, you can map out what each of these buildings actually is. You can see the church, for example, down in the bottom right hand corner, alongside the cloister which surrounds a quad, in this case laid out as a lawn, and the outlines of the remaining walls and earthworks. On the site at Monk Nash, the remains that are there support that this is roughly the floor plan that would have been present there. So just for a bit of fun, Let's see how this grange would look on the site at Monk Nash. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we can see from the old ruins and the buildings clustered around the roadsides where the outliers of this site are, so we know what space it needs to fit into. Then we need to get our bearings a bit, so we can transpose the floor plan onto this site the right way round. There's quite an easy way to do that. The altar in a 12th century monastic building will always be located on the east facing side of the building. The theory being that this was the part of the building nearest to the Holy Land. And in this instance, we can see from the little compass where east is. So as long as we drop our grange into the confines of the site to get the scale right, and as long as the altar end of the church is in the eastern corner of the site, we should have a pretty good idea of how the grange would have looked in its heyday. And this is it. Now, it's fairly crude, I grant you, so a, a little bit of imagination is required, but this is roughly how the monastic grange at Monk Nash would have looked. Scaled to fit the site, with the buildings that are here now for context. And it's pretty impressive, isn't it? But when I did this exercise, one thing in particular caught my eye and fascinated me, and it does very much take us full circle back to the Plough and Harrow. The area I've just circled here is where the plough and harrow stands today. And with the floor plan of the 12th century Cistercian Grange overlaid, you can see the original building whose outline and probably foundations and quite possibly the walls themselves have been reused to house the pub. I was fascinated. What was that building originally? 
what is it that is now the plough and harrow? I consulted the floor plan. According to the floor plan, this building, which has now been recycled into a pub, was originally the refectory. And what is a refectory? It is the place where the monks would have gone for food and refreshment, and quite possibly a tankard of ale to wash it down. In other words, by a total fluke of fate, the place where we might today visit for a bite to eat and a pint is in exactly the same place you would have gone for exactly the same thing, way back in 1130. So, in other words, this exact spot has had people reaching out for a pie and a pint for 800 years, which I think is truly extraordinary. There are people who tell me that they've seen the ghost of a monk in the bar here, and if that's true, then no doubt he is delighted that nothing seems to have changed very much. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. It's one of a series to so look out for more, uh, and it's part of an accompaniment for this book, which is Historic Pubs of Wales, which is available in all good bookshops and from Amazon. So until the next time we meet, please enjoy your history. Thank you.